Father, we come before you now, and we ask that you would open up your word to us, Father, and that you would just minister to us as we do an overview of Matthew, Lord, as we try to understand uh, from the perspective of Matthew and how he viewed Jesus Christ as the king. And, and he gives us the evidence to show his reader, the Jews, and, and the world, us, Lord, today, that Jesus is the king, that he has all the evidence, he has all the bloodline, uh, everything that is required for a person to prove that they are a king of a great nation. He has those things uh, all uh, pretty much uh, wrapped up, Lord, in, in his life, Lord. And we can depend totally upon the fact that Jesus is our king. In Revelations, it tells us that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is our king. And we receive him as our king and as our Lord. And as our king... We ask that he would lead us and guide us and direct us. And we know his heart, that he loves us and cares deeply about our future. He has wonderful plans for us. And if we humble ourselves before him, he will lead us down paths of righteousness, paths of prosperity, paths that uh, will blow our minds and what he can do with a man and a woman that humbles themselves before their king. And so you are our king, Lord, and we glorify you, Father, in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter one. <clears throat> we won't be in any particular chapter this morning. I will give you an exhaustive overview of the whole chapter, an introduction, uh, the differences between the Gospels and, and Matthew's Gospel, uh, give you some uh, information on the, the writing date, uh, the writer himself, and then even an outline. Uh, you should have received a little flyer with a general outline of the whole book, very general, it's not detailed, it wasn't meant to be detailed, and so you can put that right there in the book of Matthew, and whenever you need to reference a chapter about a certain subject, you can go right to it because you know the chapter and verse. If you don't have one, Raise your hand and the usher will make sure that you get one. So let's go ahead and, and look at the book of Matthew. Now what I find interesting um, is that Matthew presents Jesus as a king. And as I was preparing this, this subject on the introduction of Matthew, I always want to have an introduction. And, and the introduction that came to mind after doing some study was that one song. That one song that we sing every once in a while. I was hoping that they were going to sing it today. But it talks about a king dying for you. Uh, now, who of us would have a king that would die for us? That's unusual and strange. And, and it would be uh, for some king who rules a nation or a tribe that he would literally go to the battle and he would die for his kingdom and for his subjects. Now that is a king to follow, right? And that is our king, Jesus Christ. He is a king. Now we're talking an earthly king in the sense from the line of David being a king over the children of Israel or over the Jews. Now he was, a, he was God in heaven uh, part of the triunity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he was basically titled as God, or Lord, or Jehovah, or I Am. But he came to earth, and he became man, and God gave him the title of king through the line of David. And he is a king that would die for us. That truth changed my life. That truth caused me to love Jesus Christ because I've never had a person die for me. I've never had a person give up his own reputation or himself for me except Jesus Christ. And when I look at him and what he has done for me, that humbles me. And it makes me desire to glorify him in any way that I can because he literally came to this earth and he suffered at the hands of humanity he laid my sins upon him and he took my death my penalty and my place so that I could have eternal life and that's awesome to think about that's awesome to think about and we need to dwell on that more often than not we've gotten so callous towards that truth here in the United States 
and what Jesus has really done for us. A king that would die for his subjects. An awesome thought. Meditate upon that this week as you're reading the book of Matthew. Now we know that in Matthew we have four Gospels. There in chapter 1 we see the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And he goes through this genealogy. Again, being the king, he's going to prove that, that he comes from the right genealogy, the right bloodline. And we have the, the, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, and also the Gospel of John. Four Gospels giving the same message, the message of the good news Now, the four Gospels record the human ancestry, the birth and the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. They record the earthly ministry, while John, in his Gospel, adds to his heavenly existence. The Gospel of John, which is the last one of the four, is the one that shows Jesus as God. In the very first verse, he immediately uh, puts him in the heavenlies, eternal state. Uh, He's the only gospel that does that. There are no other inspired writings but the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We just don't have any others. Now, there have been others who have tried to creep into, into the church or into our society to disprove the four gospels that are here, like the gospel of Thomas. There's a gospel of Thomas out there, and apparently they're trying to push that into the, the, the scriptures as being another gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's not another gospel. It was written way, way beyond uh, the time of Christ. It has nothing to do with, with what happened with Christ. And you read it, there are so many mistakes and so many differences that it's just outlandish. You would just discard that gospel completely. No, the four gospels are complete right here. Now, there are historical documents about Jesus Christ. We have in hand historical documents that Jesus Christ and his disciples really existed by historians who weren't Christians, like Josephus. He writes about just Jesus, and he writes about uh, his disciples. Uh, I believe it's Tychicus, it's, or Tacitus, T-A-C-I-T-U-S, another historian who also writes about Jesus and his disciples, and literally mentions uh, their names in some of his writings. Now, Jesus is king in Matthew, when, G- when Matthew presents Jesus, he presents him as a king through the line of David. So Matthew wrote to Jewish people to help them understand that their Messiah would be a king through the line of David, just as he had uh, promised he would be. So he has a lot of Old Testament passages predicting the specific things that the Messiah would do. Matthew points out how Jesus of Nazareth did those things and therefore Jesus uh, promised, he's the promised Messiah and Matthew often shows Jesus fulfilling Old Testament uh, prophecies and we see that in chapter 1 right here in in the genealogy and his birth. We see it in chapter 8, chapter 12, chapter 21 and chapter 27. Jesus comes from a, a royal blood through the line of Mary. You look at the, the genealogy and you see that Mary's in that bloodline. Now we know what a genealogy is. Uh, we oftentimes look at our own genealogy. You know, I am the son of my father, Lewis, and Lewis is the son of his father, who I don't know his name, and that's as far as my genealogy goes. Now you go to Virginia's family, and they're into genealogies, and they can trace it all the way back to, to who know where. I mean, they, they've traced it far back into some interesting stories, some of them so interesting that you kind of wonder if they're even true, because we so, so often want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. But they can trace the, the bloodline of Mary all the way back to Adam and to King David. Now what I find interesting is that you have Joseph, who, who really did not participate in the birth of Christ, all that... in. The only thing that he really did was be the, the dad, the father, earthly father uh, to Jesus, but he really had no participation in the birth of Jesus Christ. He was not connected in any way because we know the virgin birth was the Holy Spirit laid the seed into Mary's uh, womb and then Jesus was born through Mary. And so Jesus was connected to the woman, uh, her bloodline. But yet, when you look at Joseph, God gave him the privilege of also being in the bloodline of David. You can trace his bloodline all the way back to King David. So you have evidence there 
of Jesus' bloodline traced back through the mother's line, but then also through Joseph's line, right to King David, giving us the evidence that Jesus is a king. Jesus is a king. Now, Jews are really uh, meticulous about keeping genealogies. They love keeping genealogies and keeping everything in order. I I believe it came from early in the Old Testament when Jesus pulled uh, Israel out of uh, of the land of Egypt and he began to divide them into tribes. And we know that sons of uh, Jacob uh, became tribes and they were leaders of those tribes. And they needed to make sure that they kept track of who was in each tribe. In this case, Matthew is from the tribe of Levi. And so how do you prove that? Well, you have to keep a good record of genealogies. Well, they've kept such a good record that today they claim that they know who are those that should be priests in the temple that's coming. And they've chosen men who are from the tribe of Levi. The, tr- the priestly tribes. And so um, they have them ready to go. When the temple is ready to be built and they begin to offer up sacrifices and so forth, they have the priests ready to step in place just as God has prescribed in the Old Testament and, and they're off and going to please God. And so I find that interesting. And so they're really meticulous in their genealogies. And so as he, they presented here, we can know for a fact that Jesus is a king. Now in Mark... In Mark, Mark's written to Romans, and it's a short book. It's written by Peter. It only contains 16 chapters. Um, It reveals Christ as a servant. And so when you read the book of Mark, you you see Jesus as a servant. You know, he came and he washed his disciples' feet. He came not to be served, but to serve and to become a ransom for many. And so he's viewed as a servant through the eyes of Mark, which... If you think about it, you know, it's written to the Romans. The Romans are the ones that are ruling at the time. Uh, They're in power, and God's trying to tell them that you really aren't in power. You really don't understand what true leadership is and what true um, dictatorship is. It's it's one that serves, uh, like the true king, Jesus Christ. He's one that serves. He's not one that dictates. He's not one that governs over his people. He's one that leads his people through example of servanthood. And so Peter writes 16 chapters here in Romans. Uh, They must have had a a short attention span, just kind of like Americans, you know. So only 16 chapters was enough for them. Now Luke, Luke looks at it from the perspective of a man. He views Jesus from the point that Jesus was fully man. Now we know Jesus was God. He lived eternally uh, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven as a triunity. He came to earth and he became man. So he was 100% man and Luke views him as man. Written to the Greeks, makes sense again. You know, here are the Greeks. The Greeks, the philosophers, you know, they would correlate God as, as being gods that were men or men that became gods and then began to rule, you know, in Zeus and, and all of these Greek mythologies and so forth. And so Luke is trying to get their attention that here's a man who is God and there is no other God but this man, Jesus Christ. And so these three Gospels now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic Gospels. In other words, they have the same common view about Jesus Christ. There are some variations and parables, you know, but basically they're, they're giving the same message of who Jesus is. The Gospel of John gives the message and presents Jesus also as the Messiah, the King, and so forth, but it adds the deity of Jesus Christ, which I think is probably important. And it makes sense that, um, that John would, would view Jesus as God. And so he presents his gospel to the world as a gospel that reveals God who became flesh and dwelt among us as believers. I think that's probably one of the reasons that it's a highly recommended gospel to read. When you become a new believer, one of the first books that people tell you to read is the John, the Gospel of John, because it presents Jesus as God. He's not just a man. You know, he's not just a Messiah, a great philosopher, a great teacher. He is literally God in the flesh. It's amazing how so many don't believe that. Even in churches, pastors who do not believe that, because it's a concept and an idea that that seems way out there that, that God would become a man. It doesn't make sense in our eyes. Well, if he's God, he can do anything, first of all, because he is God, and he did become a man. And it's important for us to understand 
Because if it was just a man, if it was just a good teacher with moral values that has come down to this earth just to give us power and victory over society and those who oppress us and do harm to us, then that's not the kind of man I want to follow. I want to follow something greater than that. And that was one of the things that led me to Christ was the fact that Jesus was God. In fact, I used to have a shirt that I bought when I first got saved and it said, Jesus is God. And I wore that thing out. It was white and the letters were green and it clearly spelled out, Jesus is God. And I had it all over my car and bumper stickers all over my Bible because that was important to me. Because a man can't die for my sins. A good moral teacher could not pay the penalty for my sins. That means I could have died for your sins or any other great teacher or this, this guru guy that has these wonderful words and sayings that people put on Facebook, you know, this, this Hindu philosopher, you know, that just kind of gives you wonderful worldly sayings about peace and, and so forth and forgiveness and stuff. He could have died for us. No, he can't because he's a sinner just like the rest of us. And so it had to be someone bigger than us. And it had to be God himself. And so it's important that we understand that it's God who became man and he dwelt among us and he became the sacrifice for our sins. So the Gospels present Christ in his three earthly offices of king, prophet, and priest. Three earthly offices offices that Jesus possesses one is that he's the king from the line of David another is that he's a prophet and that's why people were confused when you read the gospels they'd often say who is this man is he a prophet and they thought he was an old testament prophet bringing the news of God or that he was a priest uh, after the order of Melchizedek as uh, Paul says in Hebrews chapter 7 a high priest uh, one who would bring uh, offerings and sacrifices unto God's people. Uh, the prophet is God's representative to his people. The priest is the people's representative uh, to God. And so Jesus would stand in that place as a priest. And so Christ on the cross performed his highly priestly work. As the priest, a, a priest would take the sacrifice and he would offer it on the altar. Well, Jesus was the sacrifice and yet he was the priest offering himself on the altar as the sacrifice because he was God. Again, Matthew presents Jesus as a king. So write that down in big letters right there in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew presents Jesus as the king. He is ministering to the Jews and showing the Jews that Jesus comes from the line of David. Now, there are some things that we find in this book that are, that are interesting that we don't find in some of the other uh, Gospels. <clears throat> and as we go through this, um, you know, write some of this stuff down in your, in your scriptures there. But we find five disclosures. Uh, we find it in chapters 5 through 7 where Jesus spends this, this time with his disciples and he's just revealing to them some truth. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Those several chapters were the chapters where I got saved. As those chapters were read and, and Jesus would talk about lusting and he would talk about the heart of hatred and, and how if you have these things, you've committed murder, you've committed adultery because he's getting at the heart issue. And God is always trying to get at the heart of an individual, not at the mind, but at the heart to change that heart. And then that heart, once it's changed and it, it's a heart that's humble before God and, and, and turned over to God, then God begins to change the mind and then the, the attitude of the individual because he has a hold of the heart. And Jesus revealed the fact that I was a sinner that I deserve death because his truth came into my heart, that I was a, I'm going to say it very simply, bad person. I was a bad person. I did not love my wife. I did not love my children the way that I should have loved her and them. I was more concerned about my own pleasures, uh, you know, recreational drinking, Recreational drugs, smoking a little crack here and there with my friends, going out and partying a little bit on, on Tuesdays and then on Fridays and, and the whole time Virginia and the kids at home. And so it was all about me and enjoying myself. And I realized when, when Jesus was sharing with his disciples these truths that if you hate your brother, you've committed murder. And if you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. I knew that I had those things in my heart. And I knew that I was guilty. 
And if I were to stand before God at that moment and God would say, you're guilty, I would say, you're right. You deserve to punish me. That's being honest with yourself. I deserve to go to hell, and I knew it at that moment. In fact, at that moment when when Greg Laurie was sharing this on the radio, I thought to myself in my head, okay, you're guilty. (laughs) You're going to hell. Now what are you going to do? And I thought in my head, within the, you know how you can think so quickly within a few seconds of time, all, your whole life just kind of, you know, is just viewed in front of you. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to hell, so I might as well enjoy myself as much as I can before I go to hell, because I'm going to hell anyway. And I knew it. And so I, I had all these plans already within a few seconds that I was going to hell, and, and I was just going to enjoy life as much as I could. I was making more money than I ever had before. I started a job with Southern California Edison. Money was pouring in, and, and I just thought, I'm just going to enjoy myself. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the message, great, uh, Pastor um, Greg Laurie gave the hope that Jesus came to make a way for you to heaven through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. And I heard that, and I'm like, oh, wow. Here's God who came to earth, became man, and he took my place. And the hope was there. And I got on my knees in my car, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he changed my life from that point on. He had my heart. My heart was broken because it was hard so he's going to share some disclosures with us where he's talking with his disciples we also will find some parables we know some parables that will reveal a certain truth to us in 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 picture forms Uh, he'll share those things with us Um, 17 miracles are talked about not a whole lot of miracles again he's a king don't need a lot of miracles for the jews the jews know that that uh, uh God is in control and that God can perform miracles and so they're not necessarily in need of miracles they're in need of making sure that he's the Messiah that he is the king and then 66 references from the Old Testament and again that's quite a few and Matthew always treats the Old Testament material as though they're true and they're valid but he always acts like they're not complete you know, he'll take you to the Old Testament and, and he'll give you the references and so forth, but something's missing. And then that's when he presents to you the fact that Jesus is the fulfillment of these prophecies in the Old Testament. And, and that's wonderful because he, he leaves you hanging and then he answers you immediately. And then Matthew gives um, 191 uh, references himself uh, concerning Christ uh, from the Old Testament. Now, Matthew is the writer. I mean, it's obviously uh, true as you you read through this. Uh, They call it the Gospel of Matthew, and you'll find some references uh, pertaining to him. But most people, uh, commentators and theologians, will agree that Matthew uh, is the author of this uh, um, Gospel. He's also called Levi. You may read that when you read through Matthew. They reference him as Levi. It's talking about his tribe tribunal uh, designation from the tribe of Levi a Jew from Galilee who worked as a tax collector a tax collector now I find that interesting here's a man who has an occupation as a tax collector of Capernaum he engaged in taxing people like Peter who were fishermen and trying to make a living he worked for the IRS in a sense. What a job to have at that time. Um, it, wasn't a, it was a job that would bring you prosperity because you could use that job to, to um, basically what they call graft the people, gain money or advantage uh, over them because you have the ability to tax them a certain percentage and then you can make it a little bit more so that you would keep the profits. Uh, we celebrated our... 35th anniversary uh, this last Friday, Virginia and I. We went to Newport Beach and we stayed at uh, uh, the Balboa Inn there. We have stayed there uh, many times uh, years ago when we were younger. And so we decided to go back there and just spend a, a whole day there and just try to relax and have some fun and, you know, take her out to dinner and just enjoy the, enjoy the time. We rented uh, these 
little electric scooters because my injury, I, I can't enjoy uh, uh, as much as I used to. I, we would have rented bikes and then just biked all over the, the island or down by the wedge or go over to the Newport, you know, but I can't bike like that anymore. And so I'm really limited. And it is depressing at times as a man that you can't do those things anymore. So as we're kind of walking around the shops and just looking at things, we keep seeing these little uh, battery powered scooters and they're two seaters. And I'm thinking, I could do that. We could just get on that and just ride around all over the place, you know. So we rented one. We rented one for an hour and a half. And she sat in the back and I was a chauffeur, a little Mexican pulling a white girl, you know, driving her all around, you know. And she'd get off because we, we would get on the ferry. And so she didn't want to be on the, uh, on the scooter when it got onto the ferry, so she'd walk onto it. And so we get off at the other end, and I go, taxi, and I said taxi, and some guy says, oh, no, I don't need a taxi. You know, and then Virginia gets on, and I just started laughing. <laughs> you know? He thought a little Mexican guy is a little taxi making some money here. <laughs> so Virginia got on. But what I found interesting was that when we got onto the ferry, we paid $3 to go over to the other side. Okay, that was the cost, at least I thought. When we came back, the guy, the guy, this different guy said, "Oh, it's two fifty. and I'm like, "Ah, oh, someone's making fifty cents here and there, you know." And, and, and so that's what the tax collectors would do. You know, you would go to collect the taxes, and he'd tell you it's a little bit more, and then he would keep the difference. Just like this guy would say it's three dollars, and he'd keep the fifty cents for himself every so often, and so. You become hated because they knew you did that. They knew that you were keeping a little bit for yourself. And so as a tax collector, Matthew was hated by his fellow Jews. Very, very much hated. And yet his name Matthew means a gift of Jehovah. What a beautiful name. A gift of Jehovah. And Matthew became that gift because his heart changed. He was the one that threw a big old party for Jesus and invited all his tax collector friends over to hear the words of Jesus. He played a big role in getting the gospel out. And in fact, this is the only writing that we find from Matthew. We find no other writings of Matthew whatsoever, but just the gospel. No epistles, no letters, nothing. Um, there are thoughts, and by other historians who have said that Matthew wrote some letters, personal letters in Hebrew to di different individuals. And that makes sense. I mean, you don't go through your whole life not ever writing again. I'm sure he wrote something, but they're not found in Scripture. Only the Gospel of Matthew is found there. The date of Matthew and when it was written, you're getting schooled this morning, aren't you? So soak up as much as you can because it's going to make sense as we uh, continue on next week and look at the genealogy, uh, the first uh, 21 uh, generations of genealogy. <clears throat> the date of Matthew's gospel is debated uh, by many. Some believe that it was written at 37 AD, so several years after, about four years or so after uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Tim LaHaye. Uh, said it was probably written in 50 A.D. Uh, when Matthew began to write about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we find in chapter 24 that uh, Jesus makes a reference to the temple being destroyed. And we know through history the temple wasn't destroyed until 70 A.D. So we know that the gospel had to be written before 70 A.D. So we know it was written before 70 A.D. and somewhere in between that. More than likely, probably maybe 50 A.D., as Tim LaHaye probably said. Um, Usher uh, says that um, it covers a, a period of 38 years, 38 years uh, of Jesus' life and also of the disciples' uh, call and commission to go out. <clears throat> I found this interesting as I was studying is the prophecies that we have in, in Matthew they say that about two-thirds of the scriptures are prophetic. There's a lot of prophecies in there. And that it's uh, evidence that the word is God's word and proven by the prophecies being fulfilled. When you look at Matthew, 26% of Matthew is prophetic. Only 26%. In other words, many of the prophecies that Matthew gives to us, the 26%, 
uh, were fulfilled. There are a few that are not fulfilled, and we know that one of them is the rapture, the second coming of Christ, and so forth. Uh, there are predictions to the 12 apostles also in chapter 10, and there are prophetic parables, chapter 13, 20, and 22, that we find there. Uh, the coming church, Jesus predicts about another sh- another group, other sheep that that are not these sheep, but that will love him, and he's speaking about the Gentiles, the church. And we'll see prophetic uh, truth in the Olivet Disclosure also. So there are 81 specific predictions in the 278, uh, or I'm sorry, predictions in 278 out of 1,067 verses, which is roughly 26% uh, prophetic. Here's some historical um, <clears throat> timeline just to give you a reference of what was going on at that time. Not really chronological, but more topical. We know that August, the emperor of Rome, started 27 BC before the birth of Christ, and then he died about 14 AD. Matthew started about uh, 6 BC and ended at around 30 uh, AD. The life of John the Baptist was six years uh, before the birth of Christ, um, 6 BC to 28 AD. The life of Christ started roughly around 5 BC and ended at 38 AD. They believe Jesus was probably right around 30, 33 years old when he uh, resurrected from the dead. Then Herodias Antiochus um, ruled over Galilee from 4 BC to 39. So he would have been around during the time of Christ. A histor- These are historian figures that lived during the time of Christ, that evidence that the Gospels are the truth, again. Ananias served as high priest from 6 to 15 AD. Um, Tiberius is emperor from 14 to 37 AD. Pontius Pilate ruled from 26 to 36 AD. So he had become governor uh, probably around 26 years old of Jesus' age around there, so 27, 28. And then the public ministry of Jesus started at the age of 26, around there to 30 himself. Let me give you uh, an outline, and I gave you that outline there so that you have a reference to your scriptures. Now, I know some of your Bibles, if you have a New King James or an open Bible or study Bible, you'll have uh, plenty of outlining of, uh, of the scriptures, but this is just a concise list uh, of references so you can get right to it. The, for instance, chapter 1, you have the virgin birth of Christ. Chapter 2, the visit of the wise men. Chapter 3, the baptism of Christ. 4, the temptation of Christ. 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And then uh, 13, you have parables about the present age. 16, he begins to build his church. 17, the transfiguration there on the mount. And then 20, 21, Palm Sunday. Let me just talk a little bit about that, Palm Sunday. And we'll probably, I don't think we'll get there this coming uh, Palm Sunday. But Palm Sunday, when you, you read about that story, it was, a, it was a radical thing for Jesus to enter into Jerusalem like that. And then to cause so much havoc. I mean, that, that's a man that, that's ready to, to fight a battle and fight in a war. A man who's presenting himself as the Messiah, as prophesied from Zacharias uh, 9.9, I believe it was, or 6.9. Um, walking into Jerusalem as the Lamb of God, and the people hailing and, and proclaiming and throwing palm branches before him. That's a radical thing to take place in someone's life, when you really think about it. You know, we, we hear so often that Jesus is a man of love, and he is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus is a loving guy, uh, and he has nothing but love for us. But he is also a guy that will bring judgment. He's also a guy that stands for righteousness. He's also a guy that's ready to stand up and fight if he needs to. He entered into the temple there, and one of the first things he did, he looked around and he was disgusted in what the leadership was doing. He was disgusted in what they were doing with the, with the, um, the lambs and how they were deceiving the people and charging them uh, more for the sacrifices. He was disgusted that the money changers were in a house of prayer. 
And he picked up, they said, uh, a rope of some kind and he began to whip and to turn over money changing tables and, and really show, show his man side and his humanity and his frustration with humanity. And he was angry in a sense. Righteous indignation. That's righteous indignation. And that's something that we don't see a lot within the church. We're so accustomed to to wanting to just experience the love of God, the kindness of God, and, and not really get into the warfare that God has us in. I'm going to read to you something that I thought was interesting. This last week in our leadership class on Wednesday nights, we're going through a book called Radical by David Platt, P-L-A-T-T. I encourage you to get it. It's a really good read. And he challenges the reader to not just sit on the sidelines, but do something for the kingdom of God. Be radical in your faith and walk in Jesus Christ. He really challenges us. And he gives us a story here that really ministered to us uh, that night. And he talks about this um, $8 million troop carrier for the Navy. Let me read it to you. In the 1940s, the United States government commissioned William Francis Gibbs to work with the United States lines to construct an $80 million troop carrier for the Army or Navy. The purpose was to design a ship that could speedily carry 15,000 troops during a time of war. By 1952, construction on the SS United States was complete. The ship could travel at 44 knots, about 41 miles per hour. And she could st stream 10,000 miles without stopping for fuel or supplies. She could outrun any ship and travel nonstop anywhere in the world in less than 10 days. The USS United States was the fastest and most reliable troop carrier in the world. The only catch is she never carried troops at least not in any official capacity. The ship was put on standby once and during uh, Columbia Missile Crisis in 1962, but otherwise she was never used in all her capacity by the U.S. Navy. Instead, the USS United States became a luxury liner for presidents, heads of states, and a variety of other celebrities who traveled. On her, on her during her her 17 year of service as a deluxe liner she couldn't carry 15 she could carry 15,000 people instead she could house just under 2,000 passengers those passengers could enjoy a luxury of 695 staterooms four dining salons three bars two theaters five acres of open deck with heated pools 19 elevators, and the comfort of the world's finest fully air-conditioned passenger ship. Instead of a vessel used for battle during wartime, the USS United States became a means of indulgence for wealthy patrons who desired to coast peacefully across the Atlantic. What a story, huh? This is what he says. When you think about the history of this USS United States, you wonder if there's something it could teach us about the history of the church. The church is like the USS United States, has been designed for battle. The purpose of the church is to mobilize a people to accomplish the mission. Yet, we seem to have turned the church as troops carried into the church as luxury liners. We seem to have organized ourselves not to engage in battle for the souls of people around the world, but to indulge ourselves in the peaceful comfort of the world. That's a challenge, isn't it? One of the reasons that we are hosting Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Day, because it costs something. It costs something. It costs Jesus something to enter into Jerusalem there. It should cost us something to be Christians. We don't like to pay for our Christianity. We would rather be given our Christianity, and we have through the death of Jesus Christ. It cost him for our eternal life. But we don't like giving up. We don't like the discomfort. I shared again on Wednesday how I read an article about adoption. And, and from the perspective of this sister who was born into the family, she wrote about how she hated adoption. 
But at the end of the story, and, and, and the reason she hated it because of all the name calling, all the fighting, all the attention that was given to the adopted kids and not her, and so she hated adoption. But at the end of the story, she concludes that adoption is something that's needed, even though it brings suffering for some. And she was willing to go through the suffering for the betterment of others or for at least the gospel to be preached even for those kids that never had a chance. So she accepts adoption and its suffering as a good thing. And so she hates it because she experienced it, but she understands it's a good suffering to have. And we need to understand that truth, that suffering and receiving the things of God sometimes comes through suffering, through pain. And we need to rejoice that those are good things. Yeah, those are good things. That yeah, it's on Thanksgiving Day that we'll be here and we'll be serving people that normally don't come here, that, that don't contribute, that don't really have, you know, the ability to that maybe some will be welchers, some 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 have struggles, some are, you know, uh uh angry and upset and some might even bring their families and there's all kinds of chaos there but we'll be serving them anyway it may cost us something but we're doing it because it's a good thing to show that jesus loves them jesus cares about them and it costs us something it costs us to be a father it costs us to be a mother to be in a family that desires to serve god yeah it will cost you you will suffer but it's needed and costly suffering that we should embrace because we see the greater in all that suffering, the work of Christ. And God saw that in Palm Sunday as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And so we'll look at that as we go through the gospel. 24 through 25, uh, Jesus gives predictions about the second coming. And he talks a lot about what the end time will be like. And of course, chapter 27 and 28 talk about his crucifixion and resurrection. When we break this up, we'll literally find the person of Jesus Christ in chapters 1 through 4. Who is Jesus? Where did he come from? What's the evidence that he is the king? We'll see his genealogy, his, his uh, Galilean ministry, and where he started. And then in 4 through 16, we have the ministry and message of Jesus Christ. He, he will be ministering to his disciples. He will give us the message uh, whether it's it's ministering to disciples truths that they should live by parables and and so forth or whether it's feeding of the crowds of five thousands and then from 16 to 20 we see the mysteries and revelation of jesus christ uh, the declaration by peter that oh <laughs> you know you are the christ you know, you are the Son of God. The mysteries are, are being unfolded before their eyes. They're, they're coming to know that Jesus is more than just a man, more than someone that's going to set up a, a system that's going to fight against government because Jesus didn't come to do that. He didn't come to give us a system to fight against government or to fight against anybody. He gave us a system to serve and to show that Jesus came to serve and to seek and save those that were lost, to present the gospel message to them. And that's how you get the system down by presenting the gospel the, the gospel of peace and love you know jesus said of the, of the romans when you go to mark and he talks about how the romans would would ask you to walk a mile they carry their their gear and so forth and this was required by law if they saw you walking down the street and the romans were walking and, and they needed someone to carry their gear for a mile you were required to carry their gear for a mile and jesus said that's required of you he says but as a believer i want you to go more than that I want you to understand Christianity cost us something. Uh, Christianity means suffering a little bit for the sake of others. So instead of carrying it one mile, I want you to go two miles. So go beyond what they require you. And that's what Christianity is about. Going beyond what people require you. Doing the best at what God has given to you. And so if you walk one mile, they'll give you, uh, you'll give them back the gear and they'll say thank you for what you've done. And you stop them and say, no, no, I'm going to go another mile. And they're going to say, What? Why would you go another mile? That's not required of you. No, because I want to go another mile. I'll carry your gear for another mile. That's strange. Why would you do that? Well, let me tell you why I would do that. Because my Savior did that. Because <clears throat> he went to the cross for me. Because he suffered at the hands of man. He allowed them to put thorns on his head. That's going the mile. He allowed them to spit at him. He allowed them to put nails through his hands and his feet. He allowed them to pierce his side. 
That's why I'm doing it, because he did it. And that's the gospel message. And that's why so many were being saved at that time. And Peter, the mystery began to be revealed to Peter, that you are the Christ. And so when Jesus said to Peter, when others were leaving him, so Peter, are you going too? And he says, why? I don't have anywhere to go. You're the one with the words of eternal life. I have nowhere to go in this world. I, I come to you. I don't understand everything, but I'm going to come to you, and I'll continue to come to you. And so he speaks of the mysteries of Christ. And then 21 through 28, Again, welcoming him into Jerusalem uh, as the Messiah, his death and his resurrection. Let me close. The story in Matthew is about a king. And this king loves you so much. He gave his life so that you could have eternal life. This message is not just for the Jews, but it's for all mankind that we have a king who would die for us. That is a king to follow. That is a king that you can trust with your whole life. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you need to ask him into your heart. You need to ask him to be your king and to rule over you. And I, I literally mean in, in the literal sense, rule over you guys. I don't mean in the, in the spiritual sense uh, where we feel spiritual and we feel good when we pray that, Lord, rule over me. And then in, re in reality, we don't mean it. I literally mean, let him rule over you. And you follow him. That's the cost to follow this king.